but you might want to go to if you want to share it on any pages of yours or anything like that otherwise obviously you come back to it afterwards um, and share once it's finished okay so let's just find us it's happening now it's happening now and then i'm going to have to turn past us off passed off there we go fantastic so then we'll just sit here for a minute harry's telling me off that i'm late <laughs> oh it's my fault we have we have to sit here and do we get gold, do we get gold stars if we sit here long enough if you sit there long enough <laughs> um joke about aba <laughs> oh no oh i see Oh, no, sad times. Um, sad times. Okay, so hello, people. We're just gonna sort of chill like we normally do until the room fills up a little bit. Um, I think Harry's here in the comment section doing a helps. Um, and I, as you can see on the screen, I am joined by Annette Foster and Callum. Say it again, sorry. Brazzo. 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 Okay. Well, I make sure I say it right. I'm really bad with pronouncing names and I always feel bad because there's some really fantastic names in the comment section usually and I know that I butcher those names. So anyone who has a name that's difficult for me to pronounce, I do apologise. Um, so yeah, we'll just wait for it to fill up a little bit. Um, we were expecting also Sonia, um, but I'm not too sure if she pops in halfway through, we'll add her. Um, otherwise, we've got our two guest autistic artists so if you weren't already aware of what this session is today um we are or i am talking to a couple of autistic artists um about how being autistic kind of might affect their art um and how they might express themselves autistically in their art um which i thought would be quite interesting so i think we've got 13 13 people Hello, Victoria. Oh, people. I didn't even look at the comment section. I was like, oh, there's people. <laughs> okay, who's here? We've got Malia, Victoria, and Roberta. Hello, people. I know it's weird as well because it's a Friday and we usually do a Saturday. Robert's here. Robert's here with his turtle and uh, dolphin. Lovely. Okay, so we're getting our numbers up. Fantastic. Okay. So, I have got set questions that hopefully, because Harry's also doing um, a live session tomorrow with two other artists. Um, and so it's, we thought we'll have similar questions. And then again, we can get sort of a general idea across the two different groups of artists. Um, if there's any similarities in how you experience being autistic and being an artist, I guess. Um, I'm just gonna start with really obvious ones. So if I start with Callum, who are you and what type of work do you create? Well, um, Callum Barazzo, um, 28 year old uh, autistic man, diagnosed when I was 21, which when I look back is quite a definitive age in terms of the general generation of life. Um, I didn't, didn't see it that way when I started. Cried with happiness, I was like, yes. Um, Typical tale of depression, uh, anxiety is growing up. Only That's only relevant because that's where my poetry started. My dad was the one that um, told me, not told me, it sounds instructional. Um, he urged me, he encouraged me to write down my feelings. My dad was going through a divorce at the time and one of my first poems um, was called Live On. And contrary to the popular sounding title, it was actually about that stuff and how I felt about it and so I've morphed over time into a performance poet and during all, the, all this that's happening in the world I've dabbled in lots of painting and a few clay figures but I, I would say mostly I'm a performance poet. Can you tell me and explain what a performance poet is? So it's almost like theatrical rap I'd say it's it's using your body to tell stories and your voice to tell stories. It's not 
Um, Cause I've been to open mics before and they just read from a sheet and it's very rigid, um, <laughs> which is funny coming from an autistic person because that's what we're supposed to be. Um, but <laughs> that's not what I do, sorry. Um, I just, uh, yeah, theat theatrical rap or like more, more projection. Um, I try to find interesting ways to engage with the crowd. I'm still developing that side of things because I'm still in a phase of, I guess I'll always be in the phase of representing my own journey. Um, recently, over the last maybe two years, maybe I've really become part of the autistic community um, and thought, right, how can I use my tool to project other people's voices or point towards other people or use something that's collective rather than just myself. I'm just making a note to ask everybody actually how you're breaking the stereotype because you made a point that was quite interesting by saying that you'd seen a lot of um, people reading their poetry and it was kind of robotic or how, sorry how did you describe it like I was going to use the word robotic but then I thought rigid rigid sorry it was rigid yeah sorry don't want to put words in your mouth um so yeah that's quite interesting so then you're talking more about this performance poetry and how actually it is performative and that kind of would break that stereotype about how we are just meant to be very rigid or so I mean in general the whole idea of bringing on autistic artists is to show that we can be creative and this kind of thing I'm just going to admit um Sonia so Sonia's here which is great hey <laughs> hey Sonia we are currently live. Yay. <laughs> Do not swear if you can help it. <laughs> Hi, Sonia. Um, Hi, Chloe. So you're fantastically just getting in now. Um, we just had Callum. So this is Callum, um, who was just okay. describing or just introducing himself and kind of the art that he does. Um, and we were kind of um, finishing on. So he does performance poetry as well as a number of other things, just so you know where we're at. Um, and then I'm just going to ask each of you the same question, which is, who are you and what type of work do you create? So we've had Callum do that. Um, and then I'm going to move on to the other questions. All right. Um, so, yeah. So, Annette, who are you and what kind of work do you create? Can I, can I share? Because I have a few pictures and I'm better at... Ah, hold on. Let me give you the... Pictures. Let me give you the ability to share. There we go. Okay, well, I'm Annette Foster, and I've been kind of a multidisciplinary artist for, well, uh, almost 50 years. Now. No, what am I talking about? I'm almost 50, but <laughs> that would be pretty amazing if I'd been an artist. <laughs> um, no, since, yeah, I would say about 20, 25 years. Um, and yeah. I'll just share, I'm a, I, I kind of started out as a painter. I'm kind of a jack of all trades. I really love do, making things with my hands. So I, um, oh, the share thing is not, or there it goes. Oh, and it's not showing, hold on. I'm so bad at sharing. Um, so I started out kind of doing painting and fabric design and I don't know, I made beads, I did all sorts of things. I've always been very crafty, um, but I ended up kind of getting into doing um, kind of multimedia performance art um, because in a way I could do everything. I could make my, is that showing? Yeah. No, it's not. Oh, it is, I okay. Yeah. I could make uh, my own costumes, I could write my own text, I could, um, create sets, I could uh, perform, I could dance, because I love to dance, I've always loved to dance, so um, kind of just all over creative person. Um, I wasn't diagnosed um, until I was uh, 39 years old, so a lot of my career, this is one of uh, an applique that I made um, when I just was, uh, I found out basically I was autistic and I was diagnosed, um, and I was seeing all this stuff out in the world, um, about autistic people and a lot of it seemed very negative. Um, so I wanted to make something positive. So I just, this is the first one I ever made which was autism is awesome. Um, but 
prior to that, I was doing a lot of performance artwork and I made a lot of costumes. Um, as you can see, I've got a dress that was a tea set um, that I performed in. Um, I mean, a tic tac suit a long time ago. <laughs> I made my own wings. Um, the middle one is the Venus of Willendorf, which was a very small prehistoric uh, creature that, or, or, well, no, it was a fertility goddess. And I made myself into the Venus of Willendorf. Um, but yeah, I just thought it would be good to kind of show uh, uh, bits of what I've done. And then one side, found out that I was autistic, I decided that I really wanted to make some work out of, um, of about my experience. Um, although I'd been making work about being autistic probably my whole life, I just didn't know that I was making work about being autistic in some ways. <laughs> um, so one of the first things I did was um, go out onto the street um, with a sign that just said autistic and just stood there for an hour um, to see what would happen and basically people just walked around me. It was a very odd experience, but I felt like I wanted people to know um, that I was autistic and that in some respect, the question that you asked Chloe, you know, that I wasn't the stereotype, that, you know, I was just like everybody else, but I was also autistic. Um, yeah, that's probably enough, isn't it? Yeah, that's all I'll share. Oh, actually, let's see what else, yeah, I think. Oh yeah, and then I created a piece of work called Adventures of Super Aughty Girl, which was part of a PhD that I'm doing at the University of Kent, which I'm trying to finish um, now, but I, uh, which was all about my experience of being autistic. Um, it was called Adventures of Super Aughty Girl. And yeah, lots of stuff was in it. Yoga, lots of cardboard stuff, my own costume making. <laughs> I created uh, my own, Overwhelm avoidance device, which was a pop-up tent that you could carry around with you, pop it up wherever you wanted and then and just kind of feel better in a dark space and then pop it back down when you didn't feel so overwhelmed. Well, <laughs> <laughs> and I think I've got one more slide here. I'm trying, no, 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 no. Oh yeah, that's more images of Super Aughty Girl, but I got the audience involved a lot. And then I created a piece which was called uh, with a, a group of a bunch of other autistic people who I did, I created workshops with um, kind of exploring what it was, what it was like to be an autistic person, um, especially women, um, non-binary and trans people. And so I worked with quite a few people on workshops um, I did 10 workshops and then we did a performance called Adventures of Super Aughty Gang, which Chloe was a part of. And I don't know if I've got a picture here. These are, oh, these are some of the app, other appliques that I did. And I got other people to do appliques as well. Um, there we go. I'm not doing a very good job with the slides, sorry. <laughs> but this was about all about creating um, a positive kind of label or slogan for yourself because a lot of autistic people have lots of negative labels that they call themselves and other people call them all the time. And I wanted um, people to be able to create something positive for their experience. Okay. I think what I like about that is it's, um, it's kind of immortalizing that positivity. So when you're feeling down or something, you could pick it up and there's something tangible to hold. I quite like that, yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's one of the reasons why I made the appliques is it was like, for me, I made appliques of, things like theory of mind um, or you know non-neurotypical that's I didn't even know there was a word called um, neurodivergent at the time but I could like handle these pieces of fabric and I could roll them up into a ball if I wanted to and they were just these physical objects that I could kind of feel like I had some kind of control over because at the time reading a bunch of books about autistic people um, usually written by clinicians and doctors um, it felt I felt quite powerless and I felt like god these are people are saying quite horrible things about me actually that is that me is that me I, um and so that was how I dealt with it I suppose um, was to make a bunch of stuff <laughs> thank you all uh if you stop sharing for me and then I'll fantastic thank you and then Sonia so yes the question was um who are you and what type of work do you create 
Okay, so I am Sonia Buer, and I'm going to request to do what Annette's just done, but I'll try not to take too much time. If I can just share screen. I haven't prepared anything, but I just want to give a quick overview. So can you see my screen? Not yet. Okay. Mm. I think cool. as an academic myself, I'm very comfortable with the PowerPoint. It makes me very happy. <laughs> I just like to show pictures. It's so hard. Yeah, to me too. Me too. <laughs> Can so you see you the screen? Still can't see it. So if you select the one oh. that you want and then is the share button, if you make sure you press the share at the bottom. Oh, I've got to. Sh okay. Sorry. I didn't realize I've got to press share. Okay. There and we go. Fantastic. Are you seeing, are you seeing hey. my, my website? Yes. Yeah. Yep. Cool. So I was really fascinated to hear about you, Annette, and I know a bit about your work anyway, and we've met, haven't we? And um, I love your teacup dress and performance, as you know. Oh, thank um, you. I love all your work. I think it's amazing. Um, I was oh. quite fascinated by a con there's some similarities and some contrasts, which we might talk about later. But um, so I'm also a multi form artist. I also started as a painter. I've also done performance. And my work's gone sort of more digital um, latterly. And um, I also write and I have a consultancy which is about um, supporting creatives who are neurodivergent and also advocating. Um, and I think all these three areas of my practice are, are very connected. I haven't up until now actually made work about my autism. Um, I've worked very extensively on what I call post-memory, which is a family history and inherited trauma. So um, these are examples of some of the paintings that um, sort of the different galleries of works of different projects that um, sort of really speak to history and uh, try to sort of make tributes to and um, repair damage, perhaps in a similar way to, to Annette's specific work on, on autism, but mine's kind of focused on this um, historic moment, which was uh, my family's exile um, to the UK from Spain during the Spanish Civil War. Um, and sort of the consequences of living with um, a, a generation that's been traumatized and not you know, sort of an unspoken history so how that kind of has impacted on on my sort of life so um this is um sort of starting to hint this photograph here is starting to hint at the more performative side of my practice which actually um i'm now sharing a lot more about on instagram but I'd say my current practice is sort of exploring. Um, so I'm moving a little bit into the neurodivergence, exploring this desire I have for a twin, um, <laughs> which is very, very much related to just before having my autism diagnosis. Um, I'm being very alone in certain situations, uh, particularly traveling alone and wishing that I had somebody with me who was like me rather than having to um, sort of like hide away in my hotel room. <laughs> and only come out when it felt safe to do so and encounter all these people who were very much not like me and didn't seem to know about people like me. So um, that's just one um, example. Then I've kind of started more recently a visual blog because this is more recent related to COVID-19. And this thing that I just really don't have any words at the moment. So I wanted to work more visually. I haven't really kept up this visual blog. This is more of um, quite an early response. Um, cool. And it just shows really that I have a fascination with objects. I work with assemblage, collage, um, film, a lot of photography. And I've started to move into an area that I think I would like to call, um, what am I calling it? Uh, performative photography. And you can see a lot of that on my Instagram feed. So I'm kind of like, um, well, this is just a funny, funny little. And I just love googly eyes anyway. Oh. <laughs> so funny little. So I'm, I'm sort of being very much more of the moment. But I think actually what's happening with COVID is that I am, I was isolated from my studio physically, so I couldn't be a maker. Um, and I started just taking these photographs at home 
and this sort of incorporating myself with the objects previously I'd mainly worked just making assemblage pieces but now kind of I'm in the frame and it's a bit like I'm also wanting to work, work more purely with my body and bring um, bring all the strands of my practice together you know because I still carry the um, family history with me there's a lot of layers in these photographs they may look very sort of spontaneous and um, and of the moment but they actually have a whole load of history in them as well and I just love this nose sorry I've got to share that <laughs> <laughs> so I'm also kind of using my work to respond um, slightly satirically so this nose so sort of I've got this nose obsession at the moment and that came about with certain political um, scenarios Liars. and things going on in public life which just felt very very impossible to deal with so how do you deal with it you know just kind of like <laughs> <laughs> like that really very playful. <laughs> it's it. it's really playful yeah my practice weirdly weirdly since covid things have it sort of freed me to be more playful so that's kind of um oh i love this as well these are all the wasabi takeouts <laughs> <laughs> which has subsequently grown. I'm ashamed to say, look at this. And then I'll, I'll, um, I'll stop. Oh, it's not, there it place. Is. oh, I can't see where the, oh, I think the there other one is. I haven't, oh. can't find it anyway. So, so yeah. Oh, here, here it is. Significantly more. <laughs> Take out <laughs> some so I'm sort of commenting on waiting time, you know, all those sorts of things it's all, all the fabric of daily life is what fascinates me i'm just really rooted in the domestic and i think that's because i have been very um felt very secure at home um and not so secure in other spaces mm. so that this the, you know the, the autumn is there the autism is in there obviously but i'm not i'm just not being direct about it particularly and and that's not necessarily yeah i and I, I don't necessarily expect autistic artists to be this is about autism either so while that is that's I really love Annette's work for that because I want to talk about the autistic aesthetic which Annette's work we've discussed before Annette and I because we are friends we've discussed that aesthetic that maybe non-autistic people don't understand they don't understand some of her work whereas autistic people mm. seem to be able to grasp onto things and go that makes sense to me um so I don't necessarily expect it to be this is autism but it's definitely yeah. going to impact everybody's work in whatever capacity you know I'm not I'm not a, an art or I don't consider myself an artist um but being autistic, even when I didn't know I was autistic, was definitely impacting how I did research and what I thought in, you know, doing a PhD and all that kind of thing. Um, okay. Yeah, I mean, I would say that my work, obviously, before I was diagnosed was not, I mean, not consciously about being autistic, but I suppose because I'm autistic, my perspective on the world, I look back at some of those performances and think, oh yeah, that was actually trying to convey this or that, you know, I look back and think, oh, you know, there was that, that autistic part of me was there, obviously. Um, I suppose I kind of feel like artwork is a self-portrait for me always. So um, yeah. Okay. Um, but I haven't typically been working about work, about being autistic since I started my PhD. So yeah. And Callum, you're, well, in, in certain, in terms of your um, performance poetry, is that very ref much reflective of describing autistic experience or? Yeah, I've got a few on, uh, I've got one on masking. I worked with a local photographer to um, shoot some video and a video on YouTube of that. And um, one of my... <laughs> It's called Nameless and it's about uh, the myths about being autistic. And I remember at the time of writing it before, because I think it's important to recognize the different stages of the autistic journey. And I was sort of saying about, we, we don't know at the time, but we're reflecting an autistic identity. But I think um, I didn't 
the the original it might i think it's on youtube still it uh, says i have autism and there's so much more to me but there's so much more to me and now knowing what i know now and really absorbing and embracing the community and myself more i would say i, I change it when i perform it to i am autistic but there's so much more to me and then sometimes i've even clarified that uh if, if it isn't self-explanatory but i don't mean i'm autistic but there's more to being autistic i mean there's more to the myths that i've just spent my time performing to you but i get kind of anxious that people might kind of go at me because i remember when i first came out with uh, the i have autism bit and i got uh, ripped to shreds <laughs> for it, which i understand now but again not every autistic person has that self awareness uh, and the same goes for not every autistic person, like you said earlier, needs to put emphasis on being autistic. Um, <clears throat> Sonia said that, and I, I, I've met people that are just, they don't have the same community uh, passion, I suppose, or they do, but in a different way. Like for me, I'm, I'm openly autistic. I'll say I'm an, I'm an, I'm an autistic performance poet because I love it. It kind of, me, like you get, you get me. But others aren't like that, and it's it's okay. Um, and just just a little note I had on um, performance, the actual performance. So in po performance poetry, you, your voice is all about the voice and the, the breaks. And but sometimes I'll shout because I'm passionate about something. Well, that doesn't always work for autistic people, so it's difficult um, to connect with everybody. But that's just art anyway. But if, in terms of being autistic and influencing the actual art it, it, it's like well should i sometimes i'll whisper it instead it still hopefully gets the point across but it's just one of those things i i'm conscious about yeah i mean i, I oh, said autism is awesome was the first piece i made and and now i would probably put autistic people are awesome um, or my and my performance originally was called Adventures of Super Aspie Girl, and then I changed it to Aughty Girl. Yeah, definitely, just because you learn about the community, and 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 I I, I think there has to be um, you know tolerance and 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 room for all sorts of different people on different parts of their journey. I think that's really important. Yeah. Okay. Um, so. I've got another question, which is because we largely do consider autistic experience boils down to sort of sensory processing differences, um, or at least I do, and I, I, I know Annette does. Um, so the question was, does sensory processing impact your creativity? If that makes sense. So, so with my painting, but I've only recently got gotten into in terms of, uh, in regards to the poetry in contrast because <laughs> i'll just stand there and just just stand over it literally and just swipe and swipe and i'll kind of just uh get this like giddy excitement <laughs> and like the more layers more, oh, God, that's, that's amazing that's incredible and, like feet it's a it's a it's a feedback system of oh man that's amazing i'll do more I'm, oh man let's i, just, I go i'm i'm crazy i'm crazy you should see but I, but I don't know if that's sensory, but I just, there's so many different patterns that you see that are oh, man. And, and yeah. is, that, is that a bit of everything? Is that um, both the visuals, like a visual sensory? Is it stim? Is it, and is it the physical movement and um, response? Sorry, I have to keep muting, sorry, just to um, stop feedback. I'm used to being mute. <laughs> I'm used to having my dad speak for me. It's oh. weird now that I I am confident as I am. But dad, actually, I'm, I've got this. I'm cool. But <laughs> appreciate you. But um, <laughs> um, yeah, it's definitely the movement as well. I like to pace a lot, and I'll uh, just come back to being like flat. Just just uh, <laughs> it's a it's a very sensory rich experience for me visually and. Just the, the whole process of, oh, I'll, I'll just, yeah, just everything. And I, I know Annette, with yours, there's lots of yeah. sensory. I mean, I kind of think back to when I went to art school or when I start, first started doing art and they were teaching us how to see in a different way. 
um, and to you know see the things that other people didn't see and hear the things that other people don't hear and and kind of you know look at the negative space which is space around objects and and to a certain extent that was how I already saw the world so I was like wow I'm good at this this is amazing <laughs> I already do this stuff. I already see this way. So for me, art was a really, it was a savior. Um, it became my passion and um, it really helped me through a lot of my life when I was, um, I wasn't diagnosed autistic and I had, you know, was misdiagnosed with everything under the sun, you know, uh, a lot of obsessive compulsive disorder, social anxiety disorder, um, chronic depression, um, chronic anxiety, uh, all sorts of different things <laughs> over a 20 year span. Um, but art was kind of the constant um, and it was a way that I could communicate with the world without speaking. Um, it was a way that I could communicate in a way that just felt natural to me. Um, and that was, you know, I love to dance. So it was physical. Uh, that was through um, painting, uh, making things, um, even through poetry for me, because I, I've, I'm dyslexic and I'm also dyspraxic. So poetry was the first time that I actually enjoyed writing. Um, because there's no punctuation there you know you can make up words you can use a capital in the middle of a sentence if you want you don't even have to have a sentence um, and so poetry for me it was really freeing and exciting and the first time that I actually enjoyed writing um, so yeah I think in a lot of ways um, art was the thing that saved me because it was so sensory in a lot of ways and um, what about you Sonia so the sensory processing, does it impact your creativity? I think it really does, and in so many ways. And I'm just really fascinated hearing the others talking about this. And I was just thinking that um, the theme that's coming through for me is in the work, um, I'm sure it's it, these, you know, our sensory needs and preferences will be expressed in the work, I'm sure of it. And that the work is joyful because you can craft it to your own needs and it's like a perfect reflection of the joy of that both, both the need and the joy of the fulfillment of a need so um, in painting for example um, I've noticed this has changed actually I used to do very very bright colorful paintings because this was something part of a family culture that I grew up with of really enjoying vivid color um, so I'd sort of inherited this idea that I love vivid color <laughs> But actually, you know, I can't paint with it. And, and, and as, as time's gone on, I need muted colours because vivid colours are too bright for my eyes. I really suffer particularly, um, you know, I, lo I love seeing them, but I couldn't live in a house with paintings that were like that. You know, and I certainly couldn't finish the end of the day in a studio with a painting that wasn't harmonious and balanced in some way. So for me, this kind of, and, and I, I think with music as well, I'm very, very much need harmonic music and can't really cope with dissonant music. So I think I'm very, my sensory needs are very much about, you know, creating space, calming things down, opening out space, balance and harmony. And you can see that my films are all very slow. Usually I'm very aware that I'm not a dynamic, you know, filmmaker. Some people might sit there and think, well, nothing's happening. Well, that's the point. <laughs> you know, for me, that's beautiful. I'm lingering on the moment. I'm slowing down. I'm noticing the detail. Um, and, you know, I think it's absolutely no um, coincidence at all that my this performative photography that I'm developing, it's still, I'm dyspraxic. You know, I can't move in a coordinated fashion. I, I can't do these things in front of people. So I'm doing my performance in front of a camera that I'm controlling, that's on a tripod, that's got timer, and I can edit it. And it's this kind, I think it's this kind of um, idea of worlds which we can create, uh, arenas which we can create, which are actually under our control, which is so satisfying. Just over time as well, I mean, I'm thinking about the performances that I made you know, um, well, 
before I knew I was autistic were I controlled the entire environment. So I would create an installation within a room and I would be in that room and it would be a one-to-one -one performance. So it would just be me and another person and they would come in and I would be in control basically of that situation for five minutes, everything about it. Um, and these are performances before I knew I was autistic. I, I, I would have very extreme eye contact with people. And to a certain extent, I wanted people to be intimidated by me. I wanted people to feel the way that I felt when somebody wanted eye contact with me. Um, that kind of intensity of intimacy, which, which actually was easier for me than kind of quick eye contact. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely, yeah, can completely controlled the environment to extremes, you know. Um, and I look back at that now and go, oh, wow, I was really <laughs> trying to, trying to convey my experience to people and whether they understood that, you know, I don't know because that was just what I did. That kind was of, that, oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. I just wanted to say that, that I remember um, seeing videos of um, Annette's performances and this was when we were uh, going to be on a panel together and I was preparing for this panel. Um, I think it was at 2017, 2018, something like that. And, um, I remember just seeing the, this video and thinking, I see autism. <laughs> I just see what well, this is so autistic. And I'm particularly thinking of one where you were tap dancing in a pavilion and you had one person in the pavilion with you and you did this kind of like you were dressed in this very extraordinary costume with great big eyelashes. I can remember it to this day, it's so impressive. And then at some point, Annette just gets a pearl out of her mouth. <laughs> Is that right? Am I remembering yeah, right? Yeah, you get a pearl right. out of your mouth and give it to this rather startled person <laughs> who's been trapped in this space. <laughs> I put it in a box as well. Oh, yeah. And in the box were tiny little pictures of me, which were slipped down the side, which people only found if they really looked closely at the box that they took away with the pearl inside of it. <laughs> but I didn't speak in any of my performances. They were all... Um, mute it was yeah which was quite interesting as well so you know and I look back at that and go god how did I not know I was autistic you know um but I didn't <laughs> that's quite interesting as well so because both Annette and Sonia later discovered autistic right yeah so you would have started art and creating and all this kind of thing like you say before knowing you're autistic so Callum can you remind me when you said you were diagnosed in your 20s? 21. 21. You're, you can unmute yourself, sorry. It's a, I just keep doing it to make sure we don't get feedback, that's all. I can speak. Yes. It's too hard. I, I see how I functioning. Hold on, sorry. It's, it's not a bit. Um, <laughs> I make jokes like this all the time. That's uh, <laughs> um, what's the question, sorry. Um, yeah, I was diagnosed when I was 21. Yeah, so it's kind of like what kind of work or art or what were you doing before you were 21 that would Sonia and I and Annette be able to look at it and go, oh, that's a bit of autistic expression there or would that? Well, I was very there? quiet. I was a very quiet child, a very quiet child. The head of SEN told my dad at one point, I'm sorry, Mr. Bright, so we failed your son. So and because I wasn't throwing jazz, I wasn't. Although, <clears throat> so for me, um, in primary school, I used to sit in the corner, literally, and just uh, wrestle with my fingers. I, I'm a big fan of wrestling. And uh, back then, it was, it was a childhood affirmation, but as you grow, it's, it's a business. And there's more stuff I could say about that, because I, as I um, pro progressed into employment, my first job, I saw it as, <laughs> I saw myself as like one of the wrestlers going from, I don't know if anyone's interested in it, anyone's going to know what I'm talking about, but there's a, a minor promotion, as it were, and then you progress into like more of a mainstream audience. And I saw going from the beginners stages, beginning stages of my role. So wrestling's always been a big part of my life, but to bring it back, because I do, I do go on tangents. That's still kind of like a physical art, though. Hmm. Yeah, the well, the fact that I could see, like, for example, like the, the, this, that's the head, they're the, they're the two arms. And then these are the feet, so you just and you wrestle kind of like that. Um, I guess that was 
<laughs> that was uh, for for a lot of people. Uh, hmm, something's in- interesting about this person. But I I was fine. I was happy to be in my own world. I mean, at secondary school, I started to have this level of awareness of hmm, I'm not I'm not thinking like my peers are. <laughs> Why is that? I want to say she connect, but you're probably going to gossip about me anyway. And got Tourette's as well, so it's just I just kept kept myself uh, busy with writing or hiding in the toilet or not attending school at all. <laughs> but, but, but yeah, I think looking back now, um, people would say, but um, pe- people said it back then, like family. And it's interesting for me thinking about my dad's journey um, because I've met other uh, parents. I think my dad's undiagnosed as well. Um, autistic parents and and neurotypical parents. Like my my scope has has broadened extremely uh, a lot since those early days. But thinking about how the conversations he would have had, he, he told me, you know, I some someone said, you know, I think you might want to get him tested. And this is all this this this, but in my in my my so his his life was running parallel to mine, but I was just set on. <laughs> negative thoughts a lot of negative stuff but the poetry you know i'm i'm i'm, I'm fine are, are you listening yeah i'm, I'm doodling you know, that that was one for me are, are you paying attention yeah i'm just i don't need to so but you get in trouble for that you did and i used to go to when a nice so sorry, sorry. sorry. I don't know. when did you start performing then your poetry sorry i have to mute because when oh, two people talk sorry. it just goes weird I, oh, I, I just, okay we used to have cards i went to a conference once and i have like participation cards which i found very helpful when you wear them as a lanyard and stuff but talk to me it's okay or i need a bit of help or no don't come near me <laughs> we need that um i don't know when my first performance was i really i'm desperate to know when i when i evolved into a performance poet i just know that um <sighs> i mean i've got my book here this is this is not this is not meant to be a plug, so but like, this goes like dates from uh, um, from when did I start writing? About oh, eleven, I think. Uh, yeah, eight, eight to eleven. There's, there's, you might be able to see that. Live on, it says there. And maybe I should look through this and think when was the first one I performed? Probably secondary school strife, which is about <laughs> if you haven't guessed. I don't know. I, I, I want to know because it's just so organic. And like you were saying, like you said earlier about being a multidisciplinary artist, we, we all are as children because the same is with parkour. I do a little bit of parkour. I'm n- nursing a shin injury at the minute, but it's the same with you're, you're given these skills as a, as a child. And it's as an adult, you either learn to harness them or be, you're told now, now to get a real job. Know, stop stop that fantasy and, and start focusing on act, actual you've got your mortgage and you've got to do this got to do that and that's all neurotypical they're, they're all neurotypical targets so from the offset we're 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 oppressed uh, and uh yeah <laughs> so is any of that presented in your art so because one of my questions is um for everybody so i'll go round um but we'll start with callum because to sort of lead on from that so how is autistic experience represented in your art so basically what can outsiders learn about being autistic in your art even if that's not the aim is there something that people are going to learn so with yours I imagine Callum because of the nature of it being um, spoken word there's going to be I I keep it quite direct I think in my poetry because it is just me telling you this message and I might have a few where I look at a certain issue from a different perspective and uh, people make their interpretations from that because I was thinking when um, Sonia and Annette were talking about all the different things that you wouldn't necessarily know it's about an autistic identity but there's elements of the identity in it for me, I think it's, it's it's very interesting as an artist to to know the approach. So you can you can just say I'm autistic. I'm having problems with this, 
or like my I have a painting over there with the infinity infinity symbol, and for us that's a very positive sign, a community sign, and it's gold, kind of orangey gold and red, um, very for very specific reasons because they're also positive colours, but there's also a bit of blue, which is also deliberate because um, Autism Speaks, a charity that seeks to cure us. I want to kind of say that we, we've sacrificed a lot and it's almost like saying blood. It's almost like it's red because it's red, red instead is a very positive colour, like I say, but it's also showing that we've sacrificed a hell of a lot here and there's voices here, but we should be listened to more. But I think um yeah for my performance poetry it's just uh i mean masking isn't a term that maybe people are familiar with until you say it but then i'm quite comfortable most times to just have that conversation and poetry allows me a platform to do that is it okay yeah. that that yeah. sorry i have to keep muting and then i'm muting sorry but is it right to show us that piece of work yep Okay, <clears throat> I shall read it because I forget. Oh, sorry, I meant as well. I mean, that would be great, but I also meant <laughs> the painting that you described. Oh, yes, I'll, I'll, uh, I'm on my laptop, so there'll be a bit of movement. But I'll move this way. Wait just a minute. See that. Thank you. Fantastic. Because we did have a little chat um, last week and Callum showed me, so I, I'm grateful that you could show everybody as well because it was great to see it. Thank you. Um, I definitely want to hear some of your poetry. Can we do that in a moment? And then if I get the, yeah, we'll carry on with the question and then I'll come back to you again. Fantastic. Um, so Sonia, um, same question really. So how is autistic experience represented in your art or what can outsiders learn about being autistic through your art? This is a tricky one for me. <laughs> I think um, I, I've sort of developed this um, schism really where I have been talking and advocating and blogging about really, really specific. So using words like Callum to be very, very specific. I've blogged about masking. I've blogged about everything you could possibly imagine. I've blogged about, you know, funding applications for artists. I've blogged about all kinds of things. Um, but it hasn't really been overt in my art practice. Um, but obviously, as I hinted, it's it, it's all there in the layers and my practice wouldn't be what it is. So it's kind of a case of having to excavate. And I don't think many people are gonna look at my practice and want to do that. So um, it's, a, it's a tricky one. And I, I, I struggle with this because I've sometimes had people say to me, um, or I sometimes get curious and I think about this question, which I think we're touching on, which is, can you identify a neurodivergent autistic aesthetic or a creativity that's separate in a way, or that has features that maybe overlap, but are also distinct. And um, I've realized that I think there are things um, like this tendency to be multiform, which I think a lot of us share, but then so do many neurotypical artists. Um, it's the beauty of our times that we live in a time where we can do that. We have the freedom to do that. Um, but I think I, I always get caught up. And the reason being is because I don't know what it's like to be neurotypical. So the boots on the other foot and I, I, I just had a really big kind of like wake up call when I was trying to describe to somebody what, you know, this neurodivergent autistic creativity, how it was different and why it was different. And they were really cross with me because they just said, you're describing me. <laughs> that's not, that's not anything kind of, you know, and I wonder if it's that the same thing that we come across when we talk to people about our experience and they go, yeah, I have that. But then yeah, I wonder I how many lights. Oh, I can't stand. Oh God. Yeah. I, oh yeah, absolutely. I can't stand woolly, woolly clothes. Oh yeah. I know I have to have days when I don't see anyone, you know, but and then I, I wonder if, if those neurotypical artists, are they really neurotypical? Cause that, you know, <laughs> is it possible that, there's a lot more neurodivergent artists 
um, than there are neurotypical. Well, I think there's a lot going on. I think there are a lot of very complex things going on. So I think that is a definite very much a definite particularly in this case actually but anyway i also think that um this problem that we have with language where we're using the same language to talk about a different experience so of course it sounds as though we're talking about the same things but we're actually not and when i look back at my entire um art career i can see that every single thing i've done is related really to my neurodivergence and it would have to be because our cognitive profiles are what you know they're driving that they were and, and so it, you know it has to be it has to be so it's in there but you'd have to dig about I think to find it and and, and when yeah and I guess when I'm asking that question what can outsiders learn about being autistic again I, I don't necessarily mean it in the you're being obvious or you've even ever thought about you're trying to portray autism for instance I just I find it fascinating this idea that there could potentially be an autistic aesthetic not that we would ever be able to necessarily pinpoint what that is and yeah I find it fascinating um mm. but yeah and the same question to Annette and there's definitely some things that um Annette and I have talked about in terms of in terms of your own work anyway you can see a difference in telling the story or about being autistic through your work compared to other work, which won't name other people's works, but other work where it's it's clearly not a, an autistic person who maybe created that piece of work. Yeah, I mean, I think I think that obviously autistic people are very divor diverse, and we're going to have different experiences. And to say there's one neurotypical aesthetic is probably impossible um but i do think that for adventures of super Auti girl which chloe was actually a part of um i made a specific effort to portray the things that we learned in the workshops and portray i didn't want to mask because as a performance artist i was trained as an artist um, masking was something that I did because you had to be professional, you had to be on time, you had to know your lines, you had to do all these things as part of a performance. And I was like, actually, this is very, very difficult for me. And for my performance, this performance in particular with other autistic people, I don't want to have to do that. So basically I would stop in the middle of text and say I can't remember my lines I'm going to go get the text um, I'm autistic dyslexic and dyspraxic I need help here um, I wanted to portray stimming I wanted people to stim on stage because I realized during the workshops how important stimming is it's it's the way autistic people express themselves um, and it's been oppressed um, and seen as a negative thing and actually stimming is very, very joyful, but a lot of autistic people have completely forgotten that because it's been, they've been stopped from stimming, whether they have been stopped by their parents or clinicians or other peers, or just policed by themselves because they know they get bullied if they stim. Um, so I just discovered during the workshops with other autistic people that actually stimming can be amazingly joyful um and express all sorts of different types of emotions and i didn't even know that that was possible so that was something that was really important to have stimming on stage and natural stimming that kind of forced stimming um uh i'm trying to think of other things kind Can of I just make a comment about i was just thinking about the tents because so the the piece of work that annette's talking about yeah i was involved in that um begrudgingly because she's my friend um and but i did it in my way as well because i'm not i don't consider myself an artist um i, I would say i'm creative but i don't think of myself as an artist per se at all and so part of the show like i said i love a powerpoint that's just how i'm comfortable part of the show when it was me kind of having the limelight for a couple of minutes it was with a powerpoint and it was like the only way i could get you to do it <laughs> like yeah. no do powerpoint do a powerpoint <laughs> yeah and that had this idea of what we were going to do and then she was like do you know what you're comfortable with a powerpoint do a powerpoint so i got to be me but the the thing that always stands out in my mind in terms of 
really trying to understand how the audience who would have been predominantly we actually had um, predominantly would have been autistic audience because it was for the autism arts festival but there would have been some neurotypical you know non-autistic members in the audience too was when we did this tent dance and it's getting inside a portaloo tent and um choreographer dancing in these portaloo tents and that I can't even explain why we started it why we did that but it was very it was joyful it meant something to us and it made sense to us and during the rehearsals I remember sticking my head out the portaloo tent going are the neurotypical people going to understand this you know are they going to get this part of the show kind of thing and um and 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 the the rest of us were kind of like yeah yeah we're going to leave it in we're going to leave it in but we kept that bit in so in the actual live performance I do that part too where I stick my head out and say are neurotypical people going to understand this because I think predominantly autistic people did they got something from the tent dance whereas I think maybe non-autistic people would just see a bunch of adults dancing around in tents and not really getting the purpose but you know there's so many things in that that being able to dance in a tent so that nobody actually sees you you know that you're you're in your own little comfort zone but you're actually moving on stage and dancing um but also you know i wanted people to be themselves and whatever that was you know one of the participants knitted all the time whenever they spoke to people so they knitted the whole time during the whole performance so i thought that was just really important that people just be themselves um yeah and to a certain extent, I purposely did that for that performance to this extent that my supervisors actually told me that the performance was not professional enough um, and that I had um, been too generous in my performance because I had allowed other autistic people to kind of, I don't know, I mean, they've changed their mind actually now, but <laughs> kind of mess it up, I suppose, because it was very polished before, um, which was quite funny, but that was the whole purpose of it was to unpolish it, to kind of show um to unmask um, the performance to a certain extent something Sonia because I was thinking because did you see that particular performance I think you did did you I not? did see that performance yes I did um and I absolutely loved it and I I think um I'm just wondering I was thinking about humor actually and being ourselves and my performative photography that's developed and this kind of like it's permission, I, I'm giving myself permission to be myself. And it is an unmasking, but curiously, the unmasking is with props. So I'm trying, mm -hmm. I'm trying things on and I'm, you know, and, and it's, I guess it's something I've probably always wanted to do. And just always felt too inhibited because I couldn't do all the other things that a performer is supposed to do, like, you know, speak in public, um, coordinate, come on, you know, arrive on time, move my body in the right way, all those things. So, you know, um, I, I just think it's really fascinating and I loved it and I love the spirit of that performance. And I, I, you also made me think about this idea of unmasking, which I've experimented with in my studio. And some of the things, they might still be on YouTube. So some very, very early behind the scenes footage of me, um, teaching myself to speak using sand in my studio, having my, this moment where I discovered that I could actually speak fluently if I closed my eyes and manipulated sand. Um, and I think, you know, that that's something that I could have taken in, in that direction if I hadn't been so overwhelmed by the family history and the whole kind of, you know, mm. this, this other narrative that I was working with. Um, so that was just before being diagnosed as well. Um, so yeah, I think, I mean, I've gone off on a slight tangent, but I think there's so much to unpick here that, that how much can, and I remember putting another very personal film on, on YouTube about, you know, again, playing with the sand um, and being autistic and wanting to unmask. And I'm kind of like looking like this. So not looking at the camera. <laughs> And I had it on YouTube and I really liked it. And then somebody said, oh my God, I don't know if I'd be able to have that on YouTube. I'd feel really kind of like naked and vulnerable. And so I've actually put it on a private, but I might put it on public again now having talked about it. 
but it's I'm this thing say, of... I bet the people who are watching like who wants to see that <laughs> <laughs> I I just think there is something about permission to unmask permission to show the mess and that's what I loved about Annette's performance so much and your participation in it and the whole will the neurotypicals get it and I think there's a problem for me as a professional artist in allowing myself to show that process because everything is supposed to be finished and project and you know you sort of put a lot of effort into trying to get your work shown so it's about being taken seriously and being a grown-up and all these things and I think that's where the playfulness is coming in here with these photographs is I just I just want the freedom to explore and develop and express in the way that I need to so yeah and I think, I think lots then, of parallels there and I think that then depends on what even if you consider who you want your audience to be so Annette's audience I think was it that your performance was for autistic people, not necessarily to explain autistic experience to non autistic people, it was to help connect people. Um, so yeah, so there's that. Sorry, you're, you're mute. Do you want to? Um, and I'm just wondering in terms of Callum as well in a second. But. but ultimately, I would like that to be accepted the unmasking and that to be seen that I'm turning things around. And I think Sonia you know your permission to play as an autistic person is so important and you're playing with objects you're stimming basically you're making like stimmy performances <laughs> which is amazing you know um yeah so that's all i have to say just to say it, it really is and, and the whole process of editing as well for me and putting it out on instagram is a total stim mm. absolutely wonderful and that's what I'm wondering as well about Callum. So when you are doing a performance piece, you know, do you consider your audience? Are you thinking, is it, I mean, this, this would be me being very naive. Is it purely about just wanting to get that out? Is it about reaching a certain type of person in the audience? You know, um... I think when I first started, um, it was definitely just a visceral, here I am um again I really wish I knew when I started performing because I, I I write and then I remember my dad always saying oh this this looks interesting and then when I performed it to him I used to practice he would like to take on a, a new life in his words and that's part of the process for me like the writing and and then mentioned how you don't have to be neat you can just you, you know where the breaks are where the where the, what you're going to say and how you're going to say it and all that kind of stuff that only comes out in the performance. I think also it's important to know when to draw commonalities in art. So there's, there are times where, because everybody stims, everyone's a little bit autistic, will know, but there are times where you know, humanity is humanity, you know, human rights, autistic rights are human rights, people say. That's that, that should be made apparent. And then sometimes like masking, which is a very specific oppression for us, if that can't, that needs a, a little bit of a nuanced focus. But in terms of actually performing, it's, I think I try to reach, just reach people, just have conversations because that's all I'm doing performing. I'm just putting this message out. And then there, there is also, I, I feel like a responsibility almost because not everyone I couldn't and uh, it's funny people talking to me now saying that I'm so happy and I'm so I'm so uh, just full of energy well 10 years ago <laughs> then then you meet me but say so I, I like to I have a saying but I kind of live by which is where you can go no where is it what did I say um where you've come from determines where you can go or something along those lines where I like to remind myself hmm, I wasn't always able to do this and I, you know, I like to keep myself in perspective but yeah I just I just tried to, to talk through my poetry and just reach neurotypical people autistic people again it's difficult to reach all autistic people it's difficult to reach all neurotypical people because but 
autistic people specifically because of the sensory and some people have been performing in front of where are wearing headphones for obvious noise and they, they don't like that so how do i reach them well maybe it's not for them but that's okay um but yeah it's it's um certainly a process but yeah conversation conversational okay and my last thing then which is kind of right from the beginning when Callum started talking at the beginning of the live and something that Sonia's just said, which is how your different forms of art are actually breaking the stereotype about autistic experience. So Sonia mentioning playful, you know, and, and being humorous and things, you know, arguably autistic people, we don't have a sense of humor. Well, we do. It's just, you might not understand it. And, um, and Callum, right at the beginning, you mentioned about different types of poetry and things like that can be or can come across quite rigid and where the performance poetry for you, it's less rigid, whereas arguably autistic people were supposed to be robotic and rigid. So this is quite this is quite an interesting thing. So can you talk? Can anyone talk a little bit on the breaking of those stereotypes? Did anyone? Sonia, I'd want to start. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, so um, I am very conscious of the fact that um, a lot of my work is incredibly emotional and we're not supposed to have these depth of feeling or dare I say empathy. And um, a lot of my work is actually carrying out acts of extended empathy where I um, try to embody other people's experiences in order to uh, pay tribute, um, so there's there's one piece of work that I did which was actually um, paying tribute to a British artist who died in the Spanish Civil War and um, she was a very extraordinary artist and in order to make work about her I sort of had to embody her, I sort of had to almost take on aspects of her life and also um, emulate her drawing so I actually for part of it was a, a series of painted responses and I was working alongside a poet and we worked together and we both got completely immersed in this artist's life and felt as though we got to know her very in, intimately and I even had sort of a, almost an out-of-body experience at one point where I wrote a poem I'm not a poet but every so often it happens to me that, <laughs> that a, a poem appears and I wrote this poem about us you know, meeting in my studio as, but it was as children and had this whole scenario going in my head where I was sort of able to witness her life through its different stages. And if only I'd been able to prevent her from going on this fatal journey where she went to Spain and volunteered um, to fight against Franco. And if only I could have foreseen that and stopped her. And it, it almost felt like I was able to touch hands with her and I don't think many people would expect an autistic person to have that kind of experience. And I have that all the time in my work. And, um, you know, I have to dress in a certain way. I have to acquire certain objects. I have to, you know, really immerse myself in research and take on characteristics in order to make my work. So I hope that answers <laughs> some of the stereotypes. No, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah, because I mean, I was thinking more of the humour stuff, but the empathy stuff too, absolutely. Well, um, I think that goes to the heart of what we're supposed to not be able to do. And I think quite the opposite. In fact, sometimes, you know, I think a lot of us um, are now talking about being overwhelmed by our emotions and um, the pain that we can feel on behalf of other people. Um, so yeah, I think that's something that surprises people. But I have had somebody actually say to me, oh, do you think it's because you're autistic that you are such a sensitive artist? I quite liked that. I didn't know how to answer it, but I thought, oh, well, that's, that's an interesting observation. Thank you, Sonia. That's, yeah, that is kind of what I was thinking. I'm gonna, I'm gonna finish on Callum, because if you're prepared to Callum, have you got any short um, 
pieces that you would like to read for us at the end I'm just going to go to Annette first so if you want to have a think about that if you don't want to obviously absolutely don't worry um Annette I was just so in relation to what I'm saying so the whole break in the stereotypes with your work so we've heard from Sonia I'm sure you've got your own examples as well but I'm also thinking of how your work broke stereotypes and it was understood and actually helped somebody else in the audience who was autistic feel things. So I'm, I'm, I don't, we're not gonna name names because that, that won't be fair. You're, you're mute, my lovely. There we go. I know I have to, just to make sure <laughs> we're not. It's fine, it's fine. Um, yeah, the, well, yeah, from that experience, um, because for, uh, I think that there is this whole thing going on within, the clinical kind of research that there's like a female autism and a male autism and from my experience and from what my research I've discovered there's that's not necessarily the case and it's very divisive to think like that um, and there's lots of men that also um, present in a very female autistic way which I whatever that is um and i think in the show i tried to make that clear that actually there was lots of men that also masked a lot um and that um didn't present in the stereotypical way um that autistic people are supposed to be yeah and they um actually at the end of the performance they said that that was the first time that they felt like their experience had been portrayed um, which I thought was really amazing to hear from them. And they were, you know, a, a, a cis guy. Um, so yeah, I, I think hopefully that's breaking stereotypes. And I do kind of, I definitely, I mean, I really admire Sonia's work as well. I wanted to say that to her because I, you know, I and, and your blogs and everything, I, I read your blogs as well. Um, and I, I definitely have had that experience where I've done work on other artists and I get so immersed within that that I do feel like I, I take on their their kind of pain and their emotion. Um, and even from as a young child, I would walk into a room and kind of be confused because I would kind of understand that other people were feeling feelings, but I was I was like an antenna or something they were coming to me and sometimes I would get confused about whose emotions were whose and what I would what was I feeling um and and I definitely think that there's a lot of autistic people that actually are so empathetic that um it's overwhelming to them um to the point where sometimes they have to shut down and 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 um that is perceived as actually being not empathetic but it's the exact opposite so, and I guess, and part of that is in terms of the breaking the stereotypes is yes, your work, your more recent work is demonstrating that women, non-binary and trans people are also autistic. It's not a male thing. Yeah. And then going, yeah, yeah. And then going that step far, further where you and I write about how we're already behind in research by talking about female autism because it's, there's no female autism, there's no male autism, there's female autistics, male autistics, non-binary and trans autistics, mm. but we're talking really about masking largely, I would say, and it's just all yeah. autistics can mask, to, to you yeah. know, and that's how we're missing a lot of the men. So your work has been breaking that stereotype of only males are autistic as well, so there's that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. And that's kind of how I started my PhD and kind of the more I did research, the more I realized that actually it's not just women. And there's this whole kind of lost generation of autistic people um, that have not been recognized as autistic and a lot of them walking around not even knowing they're autistic still. Um, and these are people in their 50s and 60s. Um, so, you know, I'm hoping that the next generation won't have to um, wait until they're 40 years old to realize that they're autistic um, and i think that is changed has changed in the last five years which has been amazing so yeah thank you all. and so if we can finish up with callum which will be fantastic so grand full full circle now um so in terms of yeah breaking the stereotype so obviously i i picked up on the um the not being rigid and a robotic but you i don't know if you're aware of other things that you're breaking in terms of stereotypes of autism um, I guess talking 
<laughs> um, this is true, yeah. <laughs> being being verbal, like, oh you're and you get people, oh you're you're not like my son, oh you must be one of the good ones, oh my child, you know, that was, you know. Well again, I I I if I had some sort of machine to transport you back to my life ten years ago, you'd see that what I'm saying is I'm not so different and we shouldn't have this division anyway uh, in terms of um just experience of life I was I mean I, I think we could talk for I certainly could like, talk for many hours and I'm, I'm so inspired by just being around for artists and having conversations and just um things that people have said um because I'm also working on a theatre show where I want to get a bit more out there um I'm, I'm <laughs> it's been uh, maybe two years in the making already because I'm trying to make the book as well and there's so originally I had uh, something called the progression of realities where it's going to be a book a film and then a theatre show and I gave a talk at the autism show which I don't support anymore uh, I think it's been taken over by people that were there's, there's all kinds of politics and stuff and there's so much to discuss but I'll, I'll try to keep it short I gave a talk there and I found myself trying to figure out what I was talking about, although I knew, but putting internalizing that message and putting it in bite-sized chunks that other people would understand, I found difficult and I thought, hmm. But then, you know, performative photography, I've not really heard of. Um, so hearing that kind of thing inspires me to think, hmm, I, okay, this is a weird idea, but it's weird for a reason, like but it's still possible um yeah <laughs> I, was, no. I can talk uh different about different things no that's fine. Um, oh, oh sorry i'm just gonna mute you again and then I'll, I'll mute you again um no that's absolutely fine because yeah so like i say we started with this idea of not being rigid etc but you, that is a really valid point we're not supposed to be verbal you know orally verbal not supposed to have um and, and it, there's too much um emphasis placed on that as if that's the the be all and the end all as well which it shouldn't be but yeah you're a performance poet but autistic people aren't articulate and you know the myth and the stereotype um okay fantastic yeah this is this has been great this is a really good conversation um and so um i would really love to end on one of your pieces of work that'd be great all right well as we've been talking about masking a lot here's my poem called masking really imaginative here. imaginative i know um got so many gold stars for thinking of that idea going right it's called mask <laughs> serious <clears throat> but i'll focus on it camouflaged in plain sight. My brain might implode. A masking. A mannequin wrapped in second-hand packaging. Society suppression is sabotaging my disassembled self's mental health as I'm passing the norms. So I ask for reforms on behalf of the pawns in this game. We have no idea how to play as we go step by step closer to the edge of this cliff outright rejected dismissed neurotypical majorities are setting the script we're actors when can we take the mask off before we disintegrate when does the facade stop when will you see my true colors suicide and filicide i don't want to lose others but if I can mobilize the youth as a tribe of resolute lovers and empathize, there's nothing to fear. We won't have to keep the truth covered. Machine run mentalities, autopilot. It's like my true form is private, but I will make it public, won't suffer from injustice. I am autistic and I love it. But that doesn't mean that we don't have problems with environments and attitudes, but there are other options. Rather than curing what isn't a disease, autism hey. 
lost my I lost my face mentally. Good oh, I messed up the last bit. Autism is a spectrum. The answer is to listen, not division or indifference, but acceptance. That was planned end. And actually, messing it up in quotation marks just makes it perfect. <laughs> it's autistic. It's. I, I try to do that in my poetry as well because I, I, um, you know, you have a list. What I do, like things you want to perform, and it's if if I lose my place, sometimes I have to go like, oh, okay. I just make a joke. Like it's, it's not meant to be. I don't want this barrier of. I'm not supposed to mess up, but yeah, it doesn't it does make sense in the way? I, I, I and I do because, like I said at the start, I, I want to make it a conversation. I want to engage you, but if things happen, things happen. Or if, so, yeah. It's fantastic. Thank you so much. That was great. I think that was a lovely, a lovely point to end on. And um, for those who maybe are not aware, we're all um, deaf clapping. To um, Thank you. <laughs> <I am that>. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you everybody so so much did anyone have any final comments or are you all happy just thank you chloe for organizing and it's been an absolute pleasure thank you so much has be it been recorded it is yes it is great so it'll be available perfect yeah. been and there's i'm i haven't even been paying attention to the comments i usually try but um i think and can i just say i love the poem and I love Me the too. delivery of the poem, particularly. And also, Annette, I love your work too. <laughs> no, this has been amazing because I'm trying to write up my PhD and I'm trying to write in a scientific way. Um, and it's really hard, really, really hard. Um, and it's great to talk about being an artist and, and, and re remember why I'm doing all this in the first place. <laughs> and how passionate I get about it and how exciting it is to talk to other artists and I really enjoyed hearing from both of you um, about your work and it's really inspiring so thank you uh, thank fantastic right yeah. I'm just going to stop the live but you guys can stay there just for a second so thank you everybody who was here um and thank you for listening oh yeah I remember this Callum do it again for me sorry it's it's um the infinity symbol oh <laughs> All glasses, but yeah. I, 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 need, I feel like I need to give credit where it's due, but I don't know if we're naming people, but the first time I saw someone do it was the Sesson Advocate. Um, and I, I just thought it was awesome because it was, it's a nice, you know, rather than because, <laughs> so some flower land yards, there's like risks involved in that because you make yourself vulnerable. Same with art, you make yourself vulnerable and that can be used as a positive and a negative, but then the negative, just because it's possible it doesn't be negative it doesn't justify the action of being negative but you're still being prejudiced towards towards whatever it is but um yeah i just thought it's cool uh, it's a nice little yeah no, lovely uh, thing to share with everybody. <laughs> fantastic i'm just going to stop the live now so bye everybody